It's September 2nd, 2021. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 141 of Rook. Hope you're keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Durud. Thank you, Kion. Hello to you from Toronto, Kion. Hi, from also from Toronto. That's right. We are sitting <laughs> in the same studio, and thus we're both in Toronto. Hello to you from Toronto, Shaijun. Hello to you from Toronto in the other side of the glass. That's right. And hello to you, uh, dear Reza. Hello, sir. Captain Reza. Sorry. Yes, yeah. from Toronto. Uh, from t- Also in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very specifically placed to show today, as it always is. Uh, Alec Cartio is our feature guest today. The Swedish-Iranian-American, I have to ask him about that, Troika of Identities, Swedish-Iranian-American commercial film director, car aficionado, uh, and arguably the best known and uh, maybe the most significant Persian music video director uh, ever. Wow. You know, he kind of, um, uh, well, I know Shia knows this. Do you know? Do you know this Reza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You should know yeah. about Alec Al- no, Cardio. Yeah. Uh, let me explain it to Keon. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sitting here. Cool. So first of all, there was this thing called music videos. Yes, They're I remember. Sort of, yeah, quite <laughs> outdated now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, much like I want to talk to Alec about this actually mm-hmm. because my, uh, you know, I have a bit of a an issue with the fact that I find a lot of Persian pop music in particular. Mm. Not just through the 80s and 90s, but even in the contemporary sense, right. to be quite uh, unimaginative and cookie cutter. Yeah. And that was certainly the case with Persian music videos. Yes. Yeah. Very low budget, really cheesy. cheesy. They were always, they always looked the same. Uh, so in came Alec Cardio. He was quite young at the time. He was, I guess, in his 20s or something. Mm-hmm. This would be in the 1990s. And he comes and starts making, he kind of revolutionized the music video business in the mm-hmm. Iranian sphere by making these bigger budget, really interesting, allegorical cinematic kind of videos yeah. and for big names you know mm-hmm. uh, Gugush and Abi yes. and and uh, Kamran yeah. and Uman and, uh, yes actually there was a time that when you watch the Persian channel Persian music video channels uh, you could guess that okay this mm-hmm. is for Alec Cartier you know because yeah, yeah. all is very cheesy but some of them you could tell the, okay this is good because <laughs> you know the picture mm-hmm. is good the yeah. lighting is good and it's it's it was more artistic and you could say oh this is Alec Cartier well, and and you know to me it's interesting that uh, he grew up in uh, Iran and came to Sweden as a political refugee with his family um, via Spain I think mm-hmm. I grew up in Sweden uh, how this kid in his when he was in his twenties uh, had the confidence to sort of be doing these videos for the Persian icons, you know, not just for the artists of the moment, which mm-hmm. he did a lot for. Yeah. He, by the way, has then moved on to do videos for like Flo Rida and uh, oh. uh, Brian McKnight, like big, big American yeah. artists Names as that well. I recognize. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> names that are relevant to you. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's been an interesting trajectory for Alec, and now. He is, I mean, I don't know if it's now, I have to ask him about this, but he is clearly uh, fascinated by and uh, seduced by and interested in cars. And so his Instagram now is cars, where he does these promotional, beautiful films for cars and celebrates cars. So we're going to get into all of that with Alec Cardio and hear his story coming up. Before we get to Alec Cardio, we're going to be joined by... Erfan, hey. yeah, the uh, Persian hip hop pioneer, the California Esfahan kid. Uh, so Erfan just released a new song that um, I'm really liking. I just listened to it, uh, and I've been listening to it on, on repeat. Actually, play a bit, Richa. It's called Vidunko. <laughs> 
این تره لبت نمود این لب ببوسه وقتی تو بغلم میگو مثل تطور رو بدنم میگو مثل نفسی که So this tune is called Virun Kwan and uh, yeah it's great it's great and uh, no don't don't lose it Shaq keep it keep going uh, just go to the chorus here okay turn it up <laughs> So we'll play the whole song uh, later, but so uh, we've got our little round table here as we're starting the show and Airfon's going to join us in a few moments to talk about this new tune and catch up on what he's been um, up to over the over the summer, I guess, and since the last time we talked to him, which was a few months ago. So you like that music, right, Yeah, Keon? I love it. That's music really you can understand. It. I mean, I can't understand it, but I like the beat to it. <laughs> it's very Right, catchy. I mean, you understand, you like I the like music. I like hip-hop. Yeah. I like the, you know, the groove to hip-hop. He's a talented boy, a talented is. man, Arafan, and, and uh, I, I appreciate him coming on. We'll get to him in a, in a few minutes. Always has good hair. Yes, he does. You know, he you always... Know what, you know what I noticed? Uh, Reza's oh hair looks a little God. different, <laughs> and the rumor is that his girlfriend did his hair today. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, th- we were talking about, him, you know, man, first man. day of school, you know, when your parents, you see, you, that was called a layup, uh, Reza. I just <laughs> yeah, handed I that to I, Keon, I, I totally knowing she'd that. bring up your hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now, yeah. here's the thing about Reza's hair. <laughs> It is very. It's uh, it looks very nice. It does. Yeah, it looks it does. like a. It's a, it looks no no no. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but before the, the show, line. like before we started, <laughs> before we started, you know, recording here, uh, you were you were talking about the fact that his girlfriend did his hair. What what did oh she do? Well, God. I mean, she it's bl- noticeably she different. Did the Look blow drying it. or what? What did she? How what? did she? It's like silky smooth. So I was like, Reza, I like your hair. What? Uh-huh. You know, and, and, he and, and he said mistakenly what? admitted to me that his. I did. I did. You mean accidentally? He didn't want. He, he, he well, didn't mean it just to slipped want it. Out. Yeah. He's right, like, yeah. oh yeah, my. So what? How exactly? What does your girlfriend do for your hair? I'm not gonna talk about my personal <laughs> life ever, <laughs> ever. No, but I she did. Want. But uh, the the best part was then. <laughs> then Reza's like, yeah, I, there's some gel thing she put in my. Uh, sorry, I, I do the Reza voice. Mm, yeah, there's some uh, gel mm, she put in my hair, and yeah. and, and it, like as if he doesn't care. Yeah, nonchalant. Meantime, I don't know anyone. Like I thought I was into my hair. You know, I don't know anyone who's fixing their hair more than Reza, twenty four seven. Like, dude, you are uh, you are. It, it's constant with you. <laughs> I, you're like, like and we have like some glass walls here in the yeah. Rook office, yeah. and he's always looking at the glass yeah, yeah, and kind yeah. of <laughs> looking at his hair. Uh, you know, it's oh, meantime, man. Shia just looks like Gandalf. You know, it's just like a so the hair is just growing. I actually love <laughs> Shia's hair. He's putting it in a. He's, he's like a man growing bun. a pump. Yeah, his man, but it's nice. I like it. He's a bit Persian yoga now. Yeah. <laughs> he is a little bit Persian yoga, yoga mixed with Moses with uh, mixed Musa. With <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. But really, Raza, what is the deal here? You're you, who is doing there your is hair? No deal. So my hair is. Uh, Poofy, right? Is is very curly it's and poofy like and stuff. Sort of nineteen seventies yeah. uh, primetime TV. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's got some bounce to it. It's, a, yeah. it's got a bit of bounce. Yeah, <laughs> and it runs in the family, so be careful. My mom's hair is worse than mine. Right. But I usually like wear my hair short. Like I got a haircut, and my girlfriend, like she likes a. She was like, ah, let's change it up. It's COVID. Don't this is the girlfriend who wanted you to grow a, a twenty inch beard, <laughs> yeah. which yes. you also didn't yes. work. You yes. shaved it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. So what? So she so wants you to have longer hair. Longer hair, and uh, you know, I was like, you know what? It's COVID. I don't have to pay for haircuts. It's no longer haircut. COVID. There's haircuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> listen to him. Easily accessible. He, he's oh. talking as if he doesn't care about it, right? Yeah. Oh, I don't. Really oh, my my girlfriend does that. You know. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Here's the truth. Yeah. Uh, I didn't care. I didn't care. <laughs> and then she bought. She was like, I'm gonna get this relaxer, hair relaxer. It's like oh, a no. cream that you had. Like she was like, and just wash your hair with. This uh-huh. or whatever, yeah. and it's not going to be as poofy anymore. Right. So I did that, and I'm like, oh, long hair is not half as bad. So right. I'm kind of like now that it. you have the relaxer. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> He probably spent more time doing his hair than I ever did. Uh, I, d- listen, oh he there there is. I mean, I don't even know how he gets anything done. He is constantly, <laughs> constantly adjusting the hair. And, yeah. Uh-huh. Sometimes with the phone, he's looking at himself yeah, yeah. in the phone and. 
What uh, the fuck? I'm taking <laughs> selfies and sending them to, <laughs> <laughs> to your girlfriend to make sure that they are as relaxed. Sure. Yes. Get, get get tips how to maintain. So it. now that you've now that you've used the relaxer, yeah. you you think that that's um, m- uh, something to do regularly? Yeah, because I'm very relaxed right now. <laughs> 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 relaxer, I'm gonna use it constantly. Yeah, yeah. I think for long hair, like longer hair, it works, mm-hmm. especially for me. So follow Reza for more hair tips. How would we, uh, uh, Shaijan, uh, yes. in Persian? How, what do we? Uh, how do we talk about someone who is oh obsessed with their hair? What do we say? What's the term we would oh, use? Oh, obsessed with hair? Bacha yeah. Gerti. <laughs> uh, Bacha Gerti is general. Oh, it's, it's not general? only for hair. Uh. Uh, I think we don't have any. <laughs> don't, there's, no, there's no equivalent of Shekamu, but about hair. <laughs> but what do we have in English for someone who's obsessed with uh, hair? We don't have anything. Hmm. Well, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, mean, I would say like hair obsessed or somebody who's, oh. uh, you know. Yeah. What's the name of that Greek god that was obsessed with his reflection <laughs> and then fell into the water and drowned? Narcissist? That's, narcissist? Yes, that's it. That's <laughs> oh, that's our narcissist. Narcissist. Right. narcissist. narcissist. He's a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very, it's very kind of you, Keon. <laughs> it, narcissist is also a derogatory term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it in a nice insulting. way. <laughs> you know, in a nice what's, the name of that, what's the name of that word? Yeah. Uh, is it <laughs> idiot? That's an <laughs> idiot. Yeah. How do you Wh- describe... Was, <laughs> what was the god? Of stupidity <laughs> or idiots, <laughs> idiots. So, <laughs> thanks. You know, he's always looking at his reflection, and that's but right. he's that's he's right. a lovable, great guy. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Keon. Yeah. Fix that now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the 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 hair. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's nice because I'm usually the person who cares the most about their hair in the room, and and between you guys, I mean, between the, you know Moses and <laughs> and Michael Landon or whoever he's Michael supposed to be Landon. with, the, the <laughs> like 1970. Oh like the fawns yeah and you with the i mean we what? can't do a photo session without oh, no. you we have to book it three days in advance well, so that I you can go to the every salon every persian female well, let's be I honest here yeah. I, I wasn't aware that persian men were also <laughs> <laughs> equivalent to this he's got role. some relaxer in his hair there's nothing wrong with that i support that i support the thank you you're, very so much. you're taking out some it. of the persian frizz yes. right from one batch of dirty to another uh, we understand okay. settle down <laughs> 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 Somebody explain what Patrick Airty means so that we can <laughs> embrace it or not. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms and where you can become a patron. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Castbox. If you like to see some visuals with Rook and see us on social media, switch over to YouTube or Instagram right now at Rook Media as the handle. And if you like your Rook descriptions, and bulletins in English and in Persian and in Farsi. Check us out on Telegram. Hey, in the coming days on Rook, Roya Hakakian, the Iranian-American Jewish poet and journalist. Uh, She has a really interesting new book out called uh, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. Um, So excited to speak to her, Roya Hakakian. And then Dr. Fatali Mokaddam, do you know who mm. he is, Keon? Sounds familiar. Where do I know The that Iranian-born from? psychologist, author, and professor of psychology at Georgetown University. I know that you know who yeah. he is because you're into the new, it's, there's a brand new series on Netflix called How to Be a Tyrant. Yes. Or How to Become a Tyrant. Yes, that guy's amazing. Isn't he great? Oh, and he has an interesting voice. He's so good. Yeah, so, oh, I can't wait. So for the folks out there who have not seen this yet, there's a fabulous new series on Netflix, right? It's really how to Be a Tyrant. Good. It's yeah, so yeah. good. Have you how, seen it? How to Become a Tyrant. That's yeah, right. I watched yeah, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's only six episodes, right. and they're each forty-five minutes or something. Yeah. But um, uh, but and it's really well done, and it's and it's narrated by the guy uh, uh, Peter Dinklage yes, from right. Game of that's Thrones. Right. Yeah, that's right. So and and it has some experts in psychology, yeah. sort of deconstructing mm-hmm. the nature of dictators through time: Stalin, Hitler, uh, Mao, etc. And Dr. Fatali Mokaddam is one of them who has written extensively about democracy and psychology. And I really want to talk to him in the Iranian context mm-hmm. about whether um, whether democracy is even possible in the psychological mindset of democracy for those who have grown up in, in revolutionary and post-revolutionary Iran in the mm-hmm. Islamic Republic. I, I know he's written about that. He's written about democracy in the Middle East, etc. Um, and just the nature of 
talking about what he talks about in this series, mm-hmm. uh, which is fascinating. So Fatali Mogadam coming up, uh, Tara Tiba, the Australian-Iranian singer and songwriter we've been promising for a while. She's coming on the <laughs> show in the next couple of weeks. Arash Subhani, the musician, TV presenter, producer, writer, activist. He has a new kind of a musical film about, um, it's beautifully done, but it's also quite heavy. It's about executions in Iran. Arash Sopani, we'll talk to him about his whole life, but about that new project. Dr. Sharon Nazarian, or Nazarian, uh, she is an Iranian-born uh, American social activist, academic, and philanthropist, and she is currently the Senior Vice President of International Affairs for the Anti-Defamation League. Um, very interested to have her on the program. And as I mentioned on Monday, we have, uh, this is a new season of Rook with new offerings on Rook Media. So we're going to be rolling out a new slate of programs over the next few weeks uh, that is separate from Rook. So starting soon, the Contemporary History of Iran. This is a new series that uh, we're going to be running that is going to come out on Sundays, uh, looking at the modern history of Iran and Iranians through events of the last 150 years. The Contemporary History of Iran. Uh, I think we launch it in a couple of weeks on a Sunday and um, and more. I know we're going to the UK. We mentioned that. Uh, we'll let you know about more of our programming coming up. Um, it's our first week back since we took a little break uh, right. in August. And I noticed that I, I'm assuming you've been going to the gym, right? Our gym? I have, yeah. Trying to and I, I'm gonna, I, I've been back at our gym. So did you see the, the note today from our gym? I did. Only vaccinated people. Yeah. So gym. starting September 22nd, yeah. uh, I guess in a couple of weeks, right. you, I don't know if you guys know this, at our gym, which is a chain of gyms in, mm-hmm. in Canada, um, you need to show that you're double vaccinated Ooh, to wow. be able to use the yeah. gym. Shai and I go to Zurkhune. <laughs> That's right. For that. I, I, I think you definitely need to show your vaccine <laughs> in the Zurkhune. Locht, <laughs> running around with your those Sweaty clubs, sweating yeah. all over. <laughs> uh, though, what do you think of that? What do you What do you think of the uh, the Con- obligatory vaccination rule? I, I'm not gonna lie to you. I know it's a lot of people are like, oh, it's infringement upon my rights, blah 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 blah. But also, it's a private company, so they, it's their right to ask for vaccination if they want to. That's I'm true. For yeah, it. Yeah, I'm yeah. all for it because uh, and oh, by the way, you can you can now apply for like a vaccine certificate or a passport online. Did you know that? Well, the one thing is the bureaucracy of this. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to have to show up with every time. I your, guess. I think that your driver's license and your vaccine, and your, you know, because they have to prove it's you, yeah. and then your gym membership, and then your that's vaccines, and yeah, it's like going to the airport. Yeah, right. To get, to get on a fucking elliptical <laughs> machine you know, with the gulag near you. you know? uh, but uh, there's also, uh, yeah, part of me that I mean, I since we're all double vaccinated yeah. we, I guess we don't mind it you know but uh, I wonder how something this, like this would go over in the American South you know oh, <laughs> like, not very well like trusting. it just would be yeah I mean here in Canada we're sort of more accepting of uh, of this but it's uh, but you're right it's a private company it is I it mean, is but, but Keon it, how, how does your American uh, that's right your American you. side which is I code mean, for <laughs> right wing <Yeah. laughs> now how do you feel about it um <sighs> Okay, so it's mandated province-wide, meaning restaurants, gyms, uh, retail stores as well. So this is Oh, fine. I didn't know it was all that? Yeah. I thought it was it's, just that. It's not just So it's oh, not the a private oh, company so making no. the decision. Oh, so no. government mandated. It's a government, it's government mandated. Oh. I was going to correct you there, Reza. Oh. So, oh, I mean, it's controversial, right? It's... Uh, yeah, what's next like that's my concern like if they if this is no you know, this one, is one shall step. come on rook <laughs> <laughs> no one no one is allowed on Walk please check if Arafon is double vaccinated <laughs> i don't want him on the phone yeah. i don't want him near the the gushi which will the molecules will come Good through yeah. uh, it just creates a divide which i you know i don't like that i like i'm i like every every i like it to be an inclusive society right. so um, the other thing is at our gym, we're, it's very, I mean, we wear masks and you yeah. got to you gotta spray everything right. every time you use it. Right, so, it's quite safe. So, uh, yeah, in theory, I don't mind somebody who's not vaccinated right. being there because right. everybody's taking care of themselves, yeah. sort of, you know. But. but, you know, as much as I disagree with everything Keon stands for <laughs> on this particular <laughs> issue. Hey, okay, I'm double vaxxed, <laughs> by the way. Oh, okay, okay, well, on that issue. Uh, but I, I kind of agree with her. The fact that it's mandated. Yeah. Uh, by the government, it's it's uh, I don't know. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. You know what? We'll ask Airfon. Uh, we'll we'll see get what you let's get Airfon on the line. Uh, talk about his new song. Uh, a shout out to go ahead, uh, Shai. A shout out to Arash and Anita Fazalipur. Arash and Anita Fazalipur. 
the founders of MyTerms.ca, a successful mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They believe in uh, educating their clients to understand every aspect of the financing being obtained, and they see each transaction through from beginning to end to make sure that they are closed with ease. If you're looking for a mortgage in the Toronto or Greater Ontario region, if you are listening to us and you're in in Canada and in Ontario, MyTerms.ca. MyTerms.ca, they are among the best, and both Arash and Anita make it a priority to give back to the Persian community as well. Big thanks to them. Go to MyTerms.ca. All right. Do okay. we have... Uh, Hi, Erfan. Erfan, are you there? I'm here. You guys have me? How are you, brother? I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, let me give you, you guys? Let me give you a proper introduction. He is a <laughs> hip-hop pioneer. He is a, uh, I called you earlier, the California slash Isfahan kid. Uh, he's, he's kind of a mogul when it comes to, to music uh, through his, he's created labels, he's, he's managed, he's produced, he's, uh, and he, you, he's got this new song. I was saying, uh, Airfon, that I'm, I'm really digging on this new tune. Uh, Shia, play a little bit of it again. This is uh, the new tune that Airfon just dropped. So, Erfan John, you've accomplished the impossible, which is to get Keon to like Persian music. <laughs> Persian, Erfan's so different. Funny. His music's actually good. So, let's, let's just leave oh, it there. All right. <laughs> nice, nice. I'm the other people who are good, too. But thank you. <laughs> uh, tell, tell us about this song. First of all, that voice that we just heard at the end there. We'll play the whole song uh, later. But that, that, that the singing voice is not you, right? You, you're, you're rapping. And then, who's the singer? I sing at the very end. But the main singer for the song is... Uh, his name, Iranian name is Shahab, but he goes by the artist name of One in a Million, O-I-M. Oh. And uh, he's also the producer for the song. He produced the song. He's an amazing producer, singer. He's so talented. And I came in contact with him recently, uh, a couple of months ago, to a mutual friend, mutual artist friend. And we just hit it off. Is we he made, is he in Iran? Is one in the middle? Is, is no, no, he's in, here. He's in L.A. He's here. Uh, yeah, he's in L.A. And he has an interesting background. He left Iran, I think, when he was about 10 years old. And he was a singer in Iran then. So he came here, he moved to um, America, and he started uh, singing. Eventually, he landed in L.A., where we met. And uh, we've met five songs together already. You know, we really hit it off. Did he write this tune? Who? Where did the tune come from? So, the, the so inspiring, this song. The, the, the poem for the song was written by someone named Simin. She's in Iran. The part that Shahab sings was written by, by her. Shab's done some tweaks to the lyrics, but uh, mostly it was done by her. And then Shab produced the song and came up with the melodies of the singing parts, and he played it for me. And the song affected me so much. Uh, it really, it has this effect that it sounds funny coming from me. I, like it makes me laugh hearing myself say this, but the song makes you want to fall in love. Like the concept of it, the way the lyrics are, and that's the vibe I got. So I just I wrote to it and that's what I was going for and I'm like you know what I'm 30 something years old I don't think I've ever been really in love and I kind of want to be <laughs> and that's that's how I ended up writing this verse well we were talking about the Shia and I were listening to the song this morning and we were talking about uh, that and, and, and Shia was saying this is interesting he's kind of Erfan's giving a lot of himself here in terms of if this is go ahead Shia you, you actually go, yeah. yes uh, Erfan Chetari has them I'm good brother I'm, mm. actually I want to ask a kind of uh, maybe it's a philosophical question you you've said that like si o chan sal tu khodam gashtam o jaleb in ye chiz ro tu khodam nadidam o un ashqime and then and then you say that man you tra- translate that to it i've like searched my inside my internally i've been searching for myself for 30 some odd years and the one thing that i didn't see in myself found uh, yet is being in love you know with so and and then oh, later on you say that Micham uh, kind of I want to be in love. 
so exactly so this is my question uh, is love something that you you decide that I want to be in love or I, is it something that it has to happen to you you know I think it has to happen and what I'm saying is like when Jackie began like me from yeah jury behind Coliseum best use of anyways basically I'm saying I want to want to feel the burn inside my chest and I want you to kind of become my book and my religion type of thing um, and I think no it has to happen with the, we have to meet someone you know it has to happen uh, two people have to, has to be the right person uh, I definitely have the tools to fall in love <laughs> but you can't force it it has to um, happen so are you, you to, are you yeah. saying you haven't felt that before I have and I haven't you know um, I've definitely loved someone before but not no I don't think I've been in love Uh, real love before no wow With someone that I'm like this is it 100% yeah wow that's that's <laughs> quite something for a guy I mean you know you've traveled the world you have access to a lot of people you're in your late 30s I would to, to have never never felt that that's what, what do you attribute that to well again to clarify I have been in relationships where I felt loved I loved them and There's exes of yours <laughs> listing right now going, what do you mean? I know, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I've met, I mean, I've met a lot of girls in my life and I've been in a few relationships. And um, I guess I haven't been in love the way this song makes me feel like I want to be in love. You know what I mean? That was... <sighs> This is breaking yeah. news. We should put this out there. Airfan is looking for there. love. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the feeling of love that they talk about this song, like I talk about in this song, and the and the poet had, like it's just so loving and warm, and and it's something that I want to experience. Is there is there a phone number that people should dial to <laughs> offer the kind of love that you're <laughs> that you're looking for? You uh, contact my manager on Instagram. <laughs> send him your resume. By the way, have you tried relaxing your hair? Because Reza uses a hair relaxer. <laughs> oh my god. And That helps. Uh, that seems to. Airfon, Airfon. This is Reza. They're busting my balls because I didn't I, ask myself more. more sorry, it's like it that, works. Uh, it works for both. It's it like that for... Cologne and Anchorman, the Sex Panther. Right, right, right. right. Oh my god! But Airfon John, I was. It's Reza, by the way. I was gonna ask you a question because uh, your lyrics, like the, the the words in the song, it's as if you have experienced being in love. My my question is. Did you fall in love with the wrong person? Like you've always like you've experienced being in love, but it's always been with it hasn't been with the right person. Is that the right way of putting it? Of course, if it was the right person, we'd still probably be together. Uh, so it's definitely been the wrong people. But and I've again, it's just that it wasn't at 100 percent. You know what I mean? It's always like, okay, this is like this is great, but it's not where I want it to be, and that's. Precisely the reason that you know, whenever I ended my any relationships, is because I felt like I just don't feel the love that I should. Mm. You know, yeah. ولی بی کارفول ایر فرانچان چون که اش قاصان نمود اول ولی افتاد مشکل ها. Oh. I know. <laughs> 100%. I know. Yeah. Well, better to uh, 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 to love and what is it? Uh, to, better to love and lo and lose than to never love, love before and love yeah. and uh, love yeah. at all. Yeah, or something yeah. like that. 100%. Um, yeah, well, well, uh, Airfun, uh, it's a, I mean, it's a great song, man, and I'm 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 happy to get to to talk to you. I I know you've been uh, busy with various projects. One of the things that you're busy with that um, that I have to ask you about is, and I've joked with you. A little bit about this like texting back and forth but you've become like a, a chef like or or some you're, you're doing you're, you're clearly obsessed with cooking you do a lot of cooking because you post a lot of videos or other people <laughs> post videos of you of you <laughs> cooking is this like a, a a new thing with you or have you always been somebody who's um uh an osh paz I guess the best way I can put it someone asked me this question last week and I thought about it I just love doing creative stuff You know, and to me, it's just another creative thing. And I like, aside from cooking, which I really enjoy doing, and feeding my friends and family, loved ones, I really enjoy that. I think there's something to it. I just, I think great things happen over dinner and, you know, speaking with close friends and family and, you know, love flows. But uh, I like the creative aspect of just doing, cooking things I have never done before or no one else has cooked before and just coming up with new concepts for food too. The food looks great. The food that you cook, by the way, it looks. I mean, you yeah. look like you know what you're doing. It's. Uh, I came. Up, do, I made Persian ramen yesterday. I mean, Sahar was doubtful about it. She was trying it. That's our friend Sahar Goshani. What is yeah, what is Persian ramen? 
Like Persian noodles? Okay. What does that mean? What, how do you do that? Don't, no, please don't steal my ideas. Whoever's listening to this. <laughs> no, no, but um, I had, yeah, I made Persian, I, I made it with like two kinds of porridge so far. I made it with Gaiman and Fesenjun. Uh, but there's more to it than just putting the khoresh on top of the noodles. I mean, it has to be broth, but it still has to be uh, flavorful, has to be thin. It can't be thick like a khoresh. And, and the <laughs> it's, garnish, it, sounds know, like, it sounds like you're just swapping the rice for the noodles. <laughs> that's really... It's not. That's what I'm saying. That's what the point I'm trying to make is like, no, that's not the case. Yeah. So Fes and Jun ramen. That's amazing. Yeah. That's beautiful. That. Go see yeah. Saha Goshani's stories from yesterday. If you're All listening, right. you'll see it. All yeah. right, Saha Goshani, our, our, our friend <laughs> and, and, and your accomplice there. Um, before I let you go, a final question to you. And you can recuse yourself from this if it's too political for you, but we were just talking about the fact that our the gym that, um, that Keon and I go to here in Canada, in Toronto, uh, has just mandated that you have to be double vaccinated to go to the gym, uh, and actually, it's a it's a province wide dictate here. So you're in Los Angeles. I don't know if those kind of rules exist there, but what would your reaction to that be? Um, I think a personal business. I mean, they have the right to do that, in my opinion. Do I like it? No, I don't. I don't think that should be done. But I think as a as a private business, if someone feels that they 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 have you know they they want to do that. I think they have the right to do that. And I live in LA where it's like, they really do push the whole vaccination thing on you heavily. And people are super like lefty here. So I see that, but it does, it's not happening here. The gym that I go to, um, I think indoors, we just moved to the new indoor spot. We were outdoor till yesterday. So I think we might have to wear the mask indoors, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah, we've been wearing the mask indoors for when we go to the gym. But you know, in terms of your own position, you don't you don't think that we should be mandating vaccines, even if that if it, if the medical experts sort of say that makes society or the gym safer somehow. Mm, well, you know what the issue is: the medical experts have been changing what they say left mm. and right, so people don't Good trust point. the medical experts anymore. True. Uh, especially the head like Dr. Fauci and there's emails that came out specifically him about him saying like masks don't work mm. and I personally I'm not saying masks are 100% ineffective but I think people like the restaurant mandates here are ridiculous you have to enter the restaurant with a mask but when you enter and you sit down at your table you don't use it anymore like it's just, I think it's, it's a lot of games, a lot of political games going on, and it doesn't make sense, a lot of the stuff. I mean, navigating the whole thing is really is really difficult, for sure, in the sense that I, uh, I mean, I do believe in masks, but I was, but flying back from Stockholm a couple of weeks ago, uh, direct to Toronto, it's a long flight, and so we're all wearing masks, and then the food comes, and then we take off our masks, <laughs> then there's yeah, a whole plane I of people so. not wearing their masks, and then we put exactly. the mask back on, and it's like, what, are, what's going on? I mean, if I, I'm going to catch something, I'm going to catch something, but uh. I've been vaccinated myself. I've gotten both my shots, and um, I wear a mask where I have to. But I think people, they're not educating people the correct way. Mm. First of all, they're not talking about health and immune system, which is the most important Good thing. Point. I think by far it's more important than masks. I agree 100%. And even more effective than vaccination, um, in some of the studies that I've stuff that, that I've read, you know, if you have them give you if you get some you have vitamin d i'm not going to go through all that stuff but basically if you work on your immune system that's the most important thing and people in general unless they have crazy underlying health conditions and they're not you know much older people survive uh covid and then the antibodies are proven to be much more effective than the vaccine you know if, if Wh which vaccines that. did so, you get I got the Pfizer. Uh, you see? see? There see? you go. See? Elite. Pfizer Elite. The privileged. You see? <laughs> Rich kid. You know? <laughs> the common people, some of us common people, we you got that. A, let's be real. You had a choice. <laughs> you chose you to there? get AstraZeneca. I got the AstraZeneca. <laughs> down with, I'm, I'm down with the people. I don't, you know, <laughs> you and your, you went behind the velvet <laughs> rope and you went, you know, you got there in your Rolls Royce and you got your Pfizer. I got no. Pfizer. <laughs> what no. you got? No. Buddy, buddy, we got Pfizer. You guys are super <laughs> British colony, so you had to get the... He literally, <laughs> he literally just had to wait two more weeks to get the uh, Pfizer. He said, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm British and... That's blah, right. Blah, blah. I got my AstraZeneca and I'm doing just fine. <laughs> I know. No, because they, they have Pfizer and Moderna here and it was like a 50-50. I don't know which one I'm going to get, but I was dealt with the Pfizer, which they say was not good. Now, yes, I read that Japan had like a bunch of Moderna vaccines that had like uh, stainless steel in them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and then in yeah. Iran, there's a number of different vaccines that mm. uh, some of which seem 
um, <laughs> less effective than the others. It's hard to people uh, are selling muscle relaxers to people as vaccines. That's right. right that's right. And not, not, not to mention hair relaxers. <laughs> that, uh, that's Reza true. is uh, Reza. Maybe you should that's ingest the, the uh, hair relaxer and see uh, if it helps with. I want to tell a funny story before uh, you guys Please, yeah. go about this. I was speaking with my friend Dena in Iran, and she's like, "Yeah, I went to get the vaccine, and I came home." And I'm like, I don't even get sick. This is I'm kind of relaxed. And I took a really long nap. And then later I found out it was fake. And they were like, it gave you muscle relaxers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's kind of terrifying. It's you know? I know. It's, not, yeah. it's funny after the fact. But yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, I mean, I've yeah. joked about the fact that I don't know what they were giving me with AstraZeneca. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Erfan John, it's, a, it's, a, it's great to talk to you. Congrats on the new song. We'll play the full song uh, coming up uh, later in the show. And uh, always happy to hear your voice and look forward to seeing you in person buddy great talking to you all love you guys and uh, have a nice day we oh. hope you find love that's right that's right please dial uh, 1-800 airphone <laughs> paid our love <laughs> for uh, uh talk right. talk soon brother bye-bye take care guys bye there you go airphone you see you see keon even airphone is still looking for love uh, that just goes to show like no matter how successful how that's good looking right. How good the hair yet, yet is. Yet Reza did it. It's, you know, it's a big Reza has found love. Day. He has yeah, found that's love. Right, that's right. If yeah, he can do it, it, we all can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you too. The Reza and Keon. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, okay. Yes. All, right, all right. Should we get to our, our feature guest? Yes. Let's or go. He's been waiting for a while. Let's, so uh, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Ruby Shai. We'll see you in a little bit. Let's get to our feature guest. If you're a person of Iranian descent anywhere in the world who is a fan of contemporary Persian music, you will most likely recognize the work of my feature guest today. He is arguably the most successful and famous Iranian music video director worldwide and the man behind a number of clips that you've seen and know well in what was a genre of Persian creativity characterized by homogenous and uninspired video. He revolutionized the way things were done and seen in the Iranian music space. Alec Cartio is an Iranian-Swedish-American music video, commercial, and film director. He was born in Tehran in the mid-'70s, left with his family during the Iran-Iraq War, finally arriving as a political refugee in Sweden in 19. 1986. Alec has never been a shrinking violet. He graduated from the Stockholm School of Media and Arts in 2001, followed that up with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Columbia College Hollywood in Los Angeles. He also studied in theater, arts, and cinema at Santa Monica College, which encouraged him to take on filmmaking and shooting of videos. Frustrated with the dormant Iranian music video industry, he set himself out to change and improve the art by bringing in Western-style filmmaking, which made him, after a while, the most sought-after music video director in the Iranian diaspora, working with the likes of Gugu, Shabi, Kamran and Human, Jamshid, as well as major Western artists like Brian McKnight and Wu-Tang Clan. Alec's work inspired a new generation of Iranian directors to be bold and strive to experiment with their art and ideas without boundaries. More recently, Alec has been pursuing his passion for cars and melding that with his cinematic talents to make short films promoting and celebrating classic cars and their history. We'll get to all of that. But right now, Alec Cardio joins me from Los Angeles, California today. Hello, sir. Well, hello. With that introduction, I can just say hi and bye. <laughs> you don't need anything more. You think it's going to wor- just- get worse from here if, if you start I'll just, talking? I'll just excuse myself <laughs> out. And there's no need for me to talk. Hey, Baba, you're, you've done some uh, impressive things, man. It's interesting what you've done. And you're, you're a relatively young guy still. You know, as I was saying in the introduction and calling you uh, Iranian, Swedish, American, I'm thinking you're an Iranian kid who moved to Sweden with your family in the 80s. You spent many years in Sweden. Now you've been in Los Angeles. How yes. does Alec Cardio self identify. Are you Persian? Are you Swedish? Are you American? Um, well, uh, first, hello everyone, um, and thank you for the great introduction. I'm all three. I'm actually I'm all three. Funny enough, uh, I have Turkish blood too, so uh, I'm Turkish as well. So um, there you go, four of them. <laughs> I never lived in Turkey, or or it's Azeri Turkish from northern Iran, but. Uh, ancestors uh had uh, from, from baku and moscow uh, moscow they uh, moved to uh northern iran to ardabil and um 
Astara married Turkish women. Then that next generation moved down to Tehran, married, mixed with Iranians. So we're uh, we're extremely mixed. It's it. I mean, it is an interesting cocktail that you are. These are really distinct cultures, like the Swedish modesty and commitment to social democracy, contrasted with American capitalism and bravado, throwing in a Persian sense of supremacy and inferiority. I mean, how how does your troika of cultural identities affect you uh, and your personality do you think um i honestly think i've uh, if, if i'm bold enough to say i've taken the best out of each culture and uh have used it to to my daily life and advantage and you know the capitalism and the business side of things the uh, art and and the creativity comes from the swedish persian side and of course the sort of the way of uh, daily manners and and then politeness and mannerism and, and uh, having respect for people comes from our uh, iranian heritage so it's a mix of everything and then being able to speak about five six languages it helps being able to uh blend all these together and try to use the best as i can i'm, I'm not without fault of course well, what are the other languages so uh i learned farsi and turkish when we were in iran because of the family mix and then uh, Immediately when we moved to Spain, I started learning Spanish before going to Sweden. That was one year of, of Spanish, but then I've forgotten a lot of that, so I wouldn't really count as much. Uh, and then while moving to Sweden, at the same time, Swedish, English, Danish, and Norwegian, and all these got mixed into uh, the languages. And uh, being a bit of a language lover, I took German as well. <laughs> <laughs> when wow, I was yeah. in school, in high school. So I would say four or five I've car kind of fluent, but three are sort of in the back burner lingering along. And if I read or listen carefully, I can I can understand. Uh, you're, you're an interesting guy. I, I really, part of what I love about this job is excavating people's lives because I, what I go into it before I do the research thinking about the person um, gets rehabilitated or changed somehow. So I, you know, one of our team members pitched you, we should get Alec Cardio on the show. And I was like, oh yeah, the music oh, video you. guy. And yeah. uh, and then I start to dig, and, I, and obviously I want to get into your prolific and impressive career as a video maker, especially for some huge Iranian artists where you pretty much, as I said in the intro, revolutionized the genre. But Thank but you. before that, um, there's these interesting things that pop up because you've had a, a colorful life. You were a fireman in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, I so, mean, well, you, <laughs> you, you left yeah. Sweden pretty young. Like, what kind of fireman were you? I was a um, sort of a soldier trainee for the for the fire department. What happened was at the age of 18, um, you know, I went to uh, the army. But when I got to the army, the first week of it, I, I hated it. You know, the way they, they, they ordered you around, you got to wake up at 4 a.m., shave every day. And then t uh, when I picked up guns, that's when I know, okay, I'm, I don't want to grab guns and start shooting. This is not my thing. So I went to uh, the regiment and said, you know, I don't want to grab a machine gun and start shooting. I don't like it. I'm not a violent person. I don't care if I'm defending the country. Uh, and he said, well, there's only one option for you because you're already drafted and you're healthy. You're not like unhealthy. And I was actually pretty healthy at the time. And uh, so he said, you have to go into uh, the fire rescue department of, of the army. And that's how it led it to, I said, and I then immediately when I got there, I loved it. It was amazing. I'm, I'm like, this is okay. I love rescuing people. I love helping people. And it was a good full year of, uh, you know, fireman training, getting, uh, getting the, well, you didn't, the you, you didn't love it enough to stay as a fireman. Uh, the reason I, I was going to, that would be my second choice of career because what happened was the music and the film started picking up and I, and I left. So the good thing when, when you're in the fire department, uh, in the city working, you work a full 24 hour shift and that's equal to three days. And then they give you two or three days off. Ah, so yeah. those two, three days that I was off, I was, continuing pursuing my uh, uh, you know music and studies and, and film and all that and when this side took off then i left the other side it's one of those gigs that you know when you're a boy there's a there's always somebody one of your friends that wants to be a fireman it seems kind of like a cool uh yeah. gig. but but when i actually think about it I, I i'd be terrified i mean it seems like a, a horrible idea you know i mean i'm grateful <laughs> to the first responders who do it but what did you learn from being a fireman it was very gratifying. You, you, when, once you rescue a life, which I was a part of several times, it becomes this uh, huge satisfaction of, oh, wow, I did actually 
save a human being's life and it stays with you for the rest of your life and also same way when you see somebody passing away from burns or, or from a car crash and all that that also stays with you still to this day and stay with me so it has a profound impact on you for for wanting to uh become a better human helping others and uh yes the training was very brutal there were some things that i couldn't handle like going into extremely small tunnels and becoming very claustrophobic through uh through some buildings and uh but the fire part of it where you actually go in dive in uh learn to rescue people and those parts are, are really good and then alec you were also in a boy band for a while <laughs> a <laughs> swedish music side a swedish boy band and, and I, I i'll be honest with you i tried to look up i tried to find cayman uh, which is the name of the band oh, but i couldn't there, there's no cayman on spotify or anything uh, that's uh, because we changed the name of the band uh, sort of last minute right before i took off to the united states uh, if i'm going to tell you you're going to laugh the original name of the band was called get wet <laughs> <laughs> actually i looked up get wet too i couldn't find I mean, yeah. there's another no, band it's, called it's on get youtube wet. there's a bunch oh there is okay it's right. on spotify it's so many years ago it's not on on spotify it was a <laughs> moderately successful band you know i did it for eight years learned a lot of things and uh, you can find it on youtube was it when i mean was, when they call it a boy band i think in sync or like uh yeah. You know, yeah that's what it was like huh you had the exactly, the, hair, right. the hair and the dance moves and all, all of that yeah <laughs> <laughs> we were three guys, not five, though. We were three. <laughs> what happened to that? I mean, you, you just got enamored of making films? or, or um, I guess I was a filmmaker my whole life. I just didn't know it. Every time music came into my head, I got... Uh, you know these beautiful extreme uh, images it was ever since i was a kid i had uh, visuals in my head the music was sort of a secondary just uh, i just fell into it to start with at the age of 14 later on when i noticed that the images are more stronger and more powerful than the music part of it i was not as creative in the music as i was with the images that's when i sort of uh, started gravitating away from music and going to stage and theater and and uh, you know that drama in the college department and the drama department led me to being uh, part of a few productions and that's when i'm like okay i'm here this is home because i could see the images in my head before the camera was rolling. Well, you've said that you started making video music videos. You said that you have an unusual eye for cinematography and storytelling. Tell me what that means. Well, I try to draw parallel lines between the music and sort of the, the lyrics that they say with images that could sort of go parallel, but not directly. Like if somebody or if Moine is singing, that's the bizarre to that. Some put your hand in my hand. I'm not going to go show. That's the bizarre to that. Some. I'll try to find a parallel image right. of of some sort. Let's say, you know, uh, in the case of uh, Rest of Soul, Sharon K. When we had Astone Misha Gozash, I, I did a Captain Miller in in an airplane telling his love story from us while he was a 1940s dogfighter, rather than putting Astone Misha Gozash they're running around in a in a in a garden and is chasing her. Or whatever, as Tony Mishigozesh, I I created a parallel story where uh, he would be a 1940s um, a fighter pilot. So yeah. do, doing things that are more allegorical, or or uh, do, yeah. as opposed to just following the lyrics in a exactly rote kind like of in the case of uh, one of Moin's uh, videos that I did, which he couldn't understand and he was strongly opposed to. I said, why don't I instead of showing a love story, why don't I show a a uh, romantic chess game between a man and a woman and then have that chess play out the war uh, of, of dramas and the war of love between these two and he, he was like what do you mean <laughs> i said just what i said you know sometimes it's hard to explain it to those but you know we made it and then problem was that you know he he couldn't understand it so he only released half the video <laughs> What does that mean? So, what, what half of the video? Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> he, uh, he only released parts of the song and parts of the video. I don't know. Wow. It's, uh, it was many years ago. But uh, obviously, nine out of ten times were successful in making the video complete and coming. Uh, you know, I want to get into this. Um, the, the, you know, I've been savoring this conversation with you because... I've said it before on the on this program that I I've I've found it sort of dispiriting, or I've wanted to to decode why Persian popular music, Iranian popular music, has been generally um, 
generally, it remains even to a certain extent in my mind, um, homogenous or uninspired, you know, in terms of like cookie cutter. Uh, and, and, and that was, that certainly was the case with music videos. And this is why you're considered this groundbreaker who came and changed things. I mean, you end up making hundreds of videos memorable ones for Iranian artists as I said in the intro like Gugush and Abby and Black Cats and Kamran and Human. what did Alec what did you see was missing in Persian music videos what was the void that you wanted to fill and you felt you could fill several things but the first few and the most important ones were proper cinematography and coloring of the of the images they were very ancient you know typical digital video home video look so that was the number one thing uh to create beautiful images and then have great um cinematography great lighting great color correction so it actually makes makes it appealing for you to watch because music videos and commercials are highly stylized images that was number one and then add to it non-cliche non-cheesy stories so these three four items which came into my head were the reason or, or were the primary ideas I had to to be able to change sort of the, the, the visuals of the music. I mean, video. by then, the, this is by the 1990s that you're making videos. You know, you, you're. Uh, no, I know. W- I started in 01, actually. 01. So 20, okay. Well, even, yeah. even more so. Even more so. So you're yeah. in. You're, it's, it's, you're, you're 20 years past the. Um, the peak of the of, of MTV in terms of the yeah. peak of Western videos, Michael Jackson, Madonna, uh, uh, Peter Gabriel, you know, those iconic videos that were made. Why yeah. was the Iranian music video genre um, so devoid of creativity and innovation at that stage? Um, I don't know, maybe a lack of talent or lack of will of, of for people to step up and to want to actually do it. Uh, you maybe culturally we're still in that mindset that, you know, oh, music business, uh, film business is crap. You need to go become something else. So a lot of uh, kids were shying away from it. You just have to have the guts to step up to it and, and, and make it happen. I think it could be that. And the few people that were doing it, they just, you know, they didn't have it. They did. You either have it or you don't. Uh, you cannot force it out of you. You cannot. Why is it that somebody like, um, say, Bruno Mars creates amazing music, and then there's a thousand uh, other musicians who can't even cut one one track? It's just you either have it or you don't. Right, uh, but but so, to not even make the effort to make um, more cinematic videos, it's just a, it's an interesting um, omnibus decision by a culture, you yeah. know, to, to, to for all you know, that it just didn't. I mean, you you know, all of those Iranian videos that I watch, uh, and I say this with love and respect, of course, for some of the artists, but from the eighties and nineties, they they really do look like kind of embarrassingly cheesy wedding videos yeah, or something yeah. you know it goes back to that culture i guess there were there weren't enough youngsters to uh have the guts to step up to it. Uh, i just didn't have any fear i said that this is what i want to do and i'm going to do it and uh that's i guess what 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 was i had a lot of fights in the beginning with several people and you know who wanted to sort of uh discourage me uh, from a not family but uh, people in the industry and uh I said the work is going to speak for itself. So the first batch of music videos just completely shattered that wall and started going through. And then I started getting phone calls and people who I work with said, oh, you need to work with this guy. You need to see this. You need to see that. So you have to have the guts, which later on, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, the new wave of uh, music video directors are, when I'm, I have their messages on Instagram and, and Facebook and all that, but they actually said, when we saw your music videos on TV, that's when we knew, oh, we can do this too. It is doable. Somebody did it. And that's when they stepped up. And these are people such as uh, the Zawani brothers. They've told me this in person. These are like the Boucheri brothers in, in Tehran. Um, Muhammad Olad, who's a ziggurat, these are in writing. I'm not making it up. They, we needed that first person to step up, and, and the rest will started to follow. And these are all talented guys. I mean, Correct me if I'm wrong. And part of this is having a vision. Uh, part of this is having the yeah. temerity. But also, it takes a budget. And so, did yeah. you get 
I, when you talk about getting pushback in the beginning, I'm thinking that mm-hmm. there were artists or people in the business who just didn't understand, at least in the Persian genre, didn't understand the idea of a big budget music video or spending a lot of money on this. And, and if so, uh, how did you yeah. disabuse them of that idea? When you start out, this goes even for a lot of the big uh, American music video directors as well. Uh, you start with your usual hundreds of dollars, 2,000, 3,000, just to prove yourself. So that's what I did. I, I said, either I'll make one for you myself to prove myself, or you can just spend you know a little bit of money on, on the little extras here and there for the equipment, it's not, and we get some proper stuff. So I started like everybody else with a few hundred dollars, and then uh, I went up to a, a two, three thousand dollars, and then that brought the next batch with a five, 10,000, and then 100, 130, you know, it just keeps going up. As, as you go because you've proven yourself and they see that, okay, these batch of videos have been able to uh, further my career. I'm able to get more gigs. I'm able to sell more records, at least at the time before uh, digital downloading started coming. You know, so I'm making money from it. It's, it's helping me. So, uh, and record companies start noticing. And so it's sort of, you work your way up basically when it comes to the uh, Iranian music and working with some of the the big names and you know we are a deferential culture where we're supposed to defer to our elders and so you're talking about some icons that were a little older at this point you were still only in your 20s and you're making videos yes. for people like Gugush and uh, yes. um, how were you how were you not intimidated I mean how did you have the confidence to be able to say no Ebby this is the way we're gonna do this it goes back to what I uh, said a little while ago. Uh, the images came to me so naturally that I knew they were going to work. I just knew, and I tried. And I said, "Just trust me. You're going to love it. It's okay. Go put that kimono on. I'm going to put you in a Japanese garden setting, and we're going to make you a Japanese uh, geisha setting here, and all that stuff." So, and he said, "Okay." And then once he came out, then he knew that it has worked because I, I could see the images in my head, and I knew they were working. There's no other explanation for it. And that gave me the courage and the guts to be able to uh, uh, stand there and say, you know, not to mention that he had actually seen some of of my previous videos, so he knew that the quality was going to be good. I mean, you you mentioned Moeen. Were were there artists that did not give you respect or understand the role of a director, given your your youth and the, the lack of that kind of video making in Iranian circles? Uh, I wouldn't say they didn't give you the respect. It's just that uh, they're so used to their their ways that they're, they're scared of, of changes. And uh, somebody like Moin was a little bit like that. Although I did three successful videos for him, it was just pulling teeth a little bit. But I'm, I, you know, I don't blame him. Maybe he, maybe he has uh, that's his vision and all that stuff. And uh, there were some other even young ones who uh, didn't know the role of a creator director, you know. And they had to step in and try to change things the way they want to or wanted to be want to be kind of a sort of a filmmaker directors. And, uh, you know, so they, they kept uh, putting their nose into their story writing, the directing, the film, the this, the that. And it just it crashes at the end. You just uh, you're like, no, we can't do this. So you cancel the project. I was going to say, did you ever walk away from a, a video with a big name that just because the person just would, wouldn't you guys couldn't connect? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Mansur was one of them. I mean, we're good friends now. We laugh about it. But uh, he approached me uh, and uh, I said, I want to work with you. And uh, he was very happy about it. But then for every step that we took going forward, he kept pushing in his own ideas. And he kept saying, no, I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm like, then you know, why, why did you come to me then? So I wrote a treatment. He didn't even read it. And I said, no, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to do that. So I kept like, okay, okay, okay. Then, you know, I started looking for, then I said, okay, let's do a hybrid of these two. And then I started looking for locations. Once we went went to locations, he just stepped in front of me and started talking to the location managers and people, this and that, (laughs) uh, you know, doing all these kind of things. And like, this this is not how it's supposed to be done. You know, it's, uh, you're not even supposed to be here. Uh, You know, why are you even with me uh, at a location, looking at locations? So, uh, but I mean, all all power to him. I love him. I love his music. He's a great guy. Uh, and, and we're friends. We laugh about it now. And we just couldn't work together. That's it. <laughs> he's worked. He's he's worked with my brother in the music uh, part. So you know, it's it is what it is. Some people you can you can't win them all. You know, it's funny because sometimes it's the biggest stars that are that are the easiest to work with because they get it. They get the. Yeah. I mean, did you find that with some of the really big names? That yes, 
Gugush was very easy to work with. Ebi has always been a darling to work with. Um, Kamran Homan, super uh, easy. Shadmer was super easy to work with. Shadmer Arili. I don't have the full list in front of me right now, but many were uh, open to ideas and easy to work with. Uh, Alec, I, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, because it's a big, big part of your career, you also end up working with some really major non-Iranian artists as well, like yes. Flo Rida and Brian McKnight and Wu-Tang Clan. Is there a difference working with, say, a major American artist versus someone like Sepi Dare or Moeen? Oh, yeah, there's a gigantic difference. Uh, in, in our market, the Iranian market, you are one-on-one -on -one directly with, with your uh, artists, you know, you go to the house, you sit there, you talk, you, you know, you eat, you have fun, and other. With with those major artists, there's 14 filters in between. <laughs> you know, number one, uh, you need your. I had a rep at the time, uh, my music video uh, rep, uh, Laurie Scott, who uh, makes the first initial contact. Like the video commissioner at the la label reaches out to their rep and says, "We need a new music video for this, this, this." What do you have as far as roster for directors? And she sends them in. And then they said, okay, let's have this guy and this guy write for us. Then we write it and we send it in. And then they uh, have a look at it. We put in a budget. They say, oh, actually, they submit a budget at first. And then we write based on that budget. The music is extremely... Uh, uh, under locks, sometimes you have to go to the office to listen to it one or two times, and then you cannot have the song. So, and then once it's decided upon, then the management steps in, and then the label puts you on a sort of a, uh, it's like a two time, three time type of payment. You get a deposit, you start working. Then if it's satisfactory, you get the second deposit. But the video work itself is, is, is brutal. It's cutthroat. You gotta have the crews with you. You have, uh, have the locations. Everything has to be set. And then the bigger the artists, becomes the more difficult they become to work with on that sense they show up late they come up with idiotic late minute demands like we're in the middle of a, d a desert with a rapper at uh, from fuji's pros michelle and he says i want voss water and nothing else in the middle of this <laughs> you know what i mean right, right. then i have to say sacrifice one of my assistants to drive back to the city to get voss water you know, <laughs> it's just these things or, or, or Florida shows up six hours late to set and tells us, y'all got just two hours. Let's get it all done. I'm going to go to ball game. That's <laughs> that's how they are. That's how they are. They don't give a crap. But you know that what you talked about, I mean, I, that is as someone who grew up in the West and it was, uh, you know, uh, my years in a band and signed to Warner and Atlantic, that that was the way for all the videos we did it's like you get yeah. pitches from different directors that, that go yeah. through the record company and in fact they do yeah. full treatments like including like trailers and things like that and then you pick Sometimes the director and you pick so you're saying in the Iranian sphere even with the big names it would be more personal like sort of one on one you just have a phone call with yeah. them or something yeah yeah much easier uh, you get either a call from the singer directly or, or the record label and it said Alec uh, John Khubi how are you being Jewish in Bahamia so what are you doing in the Bahamia it's a very human approach to it. Uh, there's no 14 layers of onion uh, in between. And uh, you go to Starbucks, sit down, watch or go to the house. Like Google I met at Kamsa's house. And, you know, we had we had dinner. We talked about the videos. And uh, so it's very easy, you know. Yeah. Um, or with Abby, we I met him at a Persian restaurant. He said, why don't you come over here? We're going to have lunch, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we talk and we sat down. Sketch out the ideas on the napkin during kebab, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was very, it's very easy and approachable and versus the other side. However, you know, that other side could also have some easier, like the lesser uh, of the bigger. Uh, well, I, I was going to say, I prefer, I, I would prefer if the, if the Persian music industry did have some of those layers of onions to protect the artists and to, um, and, and to actually create a flourishing industry. I mean that, you know, well, so yeah, but we don't, we're not even near, we don't even have a country. So we have no laws and rules. Right. The music is free, basically. Yep. Who, who's getting royalties? Nobody. Yeah. Um, so they just put the music out so they can have concerts. Yeah, although it w certainly we can change that in the diaspora, can't we? I mean, why, why do we have to adopt what happens in Iran when we're, you know, you're working with artists that are living in L.A., as, as are you, right? Um, the problem comes with our own people. You'd be surprised how many people, regular people, I've gotten into arguments with 
I am a music video director and have access to all these songs and I still go to iTunes and buy them for whatever it is and bring them or buy the CDs, people would say, are you crazy? Me paying for that song? I can download it on the internet for free. Why would I go pay a dollar for that song? This is exactly what they say. I apologize. Some it's, it's thieves. These are thieves who actually go download the songs for free. That's my that's my opinion. They were sitting in front of me. I'm like, so do you go to a store and grab a shampoo and put it in your pocket and come out, or do you right. pay for it? Right. I pay for it. Right. I'm like, that's what you're doing. You're you're stealing that shampoo. That's not your song to steal. Why do you go take it? But, that, but it my, my, my question is, why have we? Because I mean, this is a, a particularly heartbreaking. Why why have we imported that from Iran? I mean, you haven't lived it, but you know, I mean, why aren't we changing things? You know, I don't know. Uh, but people don't care about. It. They don't. Uh, you know, we're living like uh, somebody once told me. We, we're like gypsies living in tents. Uh, as as refugees around the world, we don't have a country. We don't have laws. That's that's what it comes down to. Even if we're in the Western world, it doesn't apply to our own music, culture, and music, and all that. Uh, you know, people would happily go pay twelve dollars for for somebody's uh, a Western artist CD to buy, it, but but they wouldn't do it for for their own because we don't have laws and rules. I always say that, you know, you go to one of these Persian galas and uh, the centerpiece on the table costs like $10,000, but they're not willing to pay the band, yeah. you know? <laughs> like it's, yeah. Like, yeah. it's like we got our typical, priorities very mixed typical, up. Very yeah. Typical. Uh, yeah. Well, Alec, I'm sorry, I got heated up here for a second. No, I mean, listen, the, 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 the show's called Rook. Uh, wh yeah. Why did you... Uh, now that we've established that you you know revolutionized the genre for Persian artists and or in, in video and, and and had so much success, why did you stop making music videos? Several reasons. I got you know just tired of of uh, shooting music videos, and uh, it was sort of a becoming a repetitive art craft. And uh, with the illegal digital downloading and existence of YouTube and uh, Instagram and all that stuff, the music video world has become less colorful as we have gone now we have singers and artists displaying themselves on instagram and, and facebook 24 7 even when they're in a bathroom you know doing whatever they do so the music video becomes less of a colorful world right. and what's the point so there's less and less money as well but you know i've just overall grown tired of, of the format and uh you know, I just gravitated and changed and combined my art with the love of uh, car art that I've always had. So, yeah, I want I want to get into the car thing, but what you, what you just said is actually really really interesting because if I think about being a kid uh, in the '80s and even into the '90s, and you know, your only access to like mm -hmm. Guns N' Roses was their videos. You know, that was exactly. like, you wouldn't, I mean, I don't know how I would, have, I don't know if the videos would have been as magical if I would be seeing Slash and Axl Rose on on Instagram 24 seven, you know? Yeah, no, it's, you get tired of it, you get yeah, tired of it. It's, yeah. it's just, music videos don't mean anything anymore when they have all that beautiful glam and, and, and lighting and all that. And what's the point of doing that and then coming in, uh, seeing the artist posting 4,000 photos themselves in, in a regular day day setting where and, and and just one post of music or one post of music video it's you get tired of it you, you i mean you just mentioned cars so i want to segue into that you're now focused on cars you become this car specialist historian promoter filmmaker first of all has this always been a passion of yours this the the, the car thing is that up there with oh yeah yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I've been in love with cars. Uh, it was, um, I guess, I, I sort of inherited it from my dad and uncle. And um, the f only thing I could think about when I was a teenager was getting my license and cars and car magazines and, uh, you know, anything under the sun that had to do with cars. And uh, when I started making money after college and all that, any extra money uh, that would come i was always frequenting ebay auto trader you know craigslist what have you to, to try to find <laughs> cars and play around with and go to car shows and so it just uh it's been with me all my life and uh one day at the suggestion of a friend uh, he said why don't you combine the two you have the art of filmmaking and the art of cars see what you can make out of it and that became the new business so you've got a pretty popular Instagram channel. You post about cars there. What is it you want 
people to know or what is it that people want to know from you on this channel well that channel originally was the alec cartio music video channel that's why there are so many <laughs> followers on there because they were following all the music videos with shotman and all that stuff all those fans so that's sort of a right now i'm bring, dragging that along with me and I've, I've gotten a lot of complaints from a lot of people who were on that originally say hey why are you posting cars where's where are photos of the <laughs> singers we love <laughs> you know so they, they, there's there's less and less interest but a few thousand people on there are actually car people and what i want them to see is cartiology is cartier is my last name and then of course the word car is in cartio cartiology okay. so well it's it's a business i created for creating historic films and passion films and ownership films about classic cars with years and years of history and once uh, one car gets passed on from one custodian to another custodian that's where i come in to create that memorable uh, sort of a historic uh, transfer between the two and that's where the monetization comes in from the sale of the the, the transfer i'm assuming most of your audience your fans on say social media are, are iranian right uh, yes, from over time, yes. So we, we recently did an episode of Rook about Persians and cars and trying to discover what what is this weird kinetic connection that uh, of why Persians are so obsessed with cars and particular brands. What is your philosophy on why Iranians are so into cars and, and of course, specific brands of cars? Um, has to do with success in life and obsession with the finer things in life and you know driving a Benz and a BMW or whatever it, it shows status you know it's just we, we are into the finer things in life and the same way they want us to become a Dr. Mohandas and Vakil they also want us to drive a BMW Benz and Porsche you know it's just a cultural thing I guess Armenians are that way um, Asians are that way and are uh, you that way would you be uh, okay driving or, a Toyota? I have owned several Toyotas. I had a lot of beta cars, but I always strived to have better and better and better. And yes, yes, I am that way as well. However, I have a lot of love for classic cars too. So I'm, I'm not shy to say that I I love the finer cars as well. No no doubt about it. It's funny, these guys uh, that we had on, uh, Ali Bekhradi and, and Vahid, they, they, were, they were saying that even if it's like a really brilliant classic or, or even something like a Range Rover if it's not a Benz or a BMW some Iranians will reject it <laughs> yeah to, to a certain degree I mean um, I'm not too super into brand brand new cars but you know beautiful cars in general um let me um, go back to where we started in this conversation, and and uh, it's been really interesting talking to you about your journey, and and you know you you are somebody who left at a pretty young age, and when you first went to Sweden, um, mm -hmm. I know there was a year or two where you're you're sort of in nowhere's land, and then you go to Sweden and you're a political refugee. Um, it seems to me that you've you've despite the fact that you've spent you know four-fifths of your life outside of Iran. You've really maintained a connection with being Iranian, and that's been very much a part of your work and your career life as well. Um, can you reflect on that? It has to do with the fact that uh, the Iranian culture and heritage follows us in, in Europe. In the United States, the American culture takes over completely, and the English language takes over. But in Europe, uh, parents and kids actually do follow they encourage we go to farsi classes two three times a week we all the kids do speak farsi to each other and to a certain degree we don't have the same connection with certain some of those languages as we do maybe with english or with our own uh, so it sort of continues we keep a good hybrid of all the multicultural languages and also but mainly we keep our own to start with i was always interested in reading farsi books watching farsi shows while i was also doing the same thing with the swedish with the english with the mm. scandinavians and whatnot so uh, i'm not alone like this there are many like me in scandinavia who speak multiple languages who speak farsi fluently who read farsi and speak swedish and uh english and all that stuff it was it's just a part of sweden in general keeps your heritage very strongly for you while they say incorporate ours too so you get a hundred percent of each culture 
But isn't that true of America as well, to a certain extent? I mean, how how do how, how would you explain Westwood otherwise, or Tehranjali's, or even uh, Tor- Toronto? These they do. Days? There, there, there's uh, there's a uh, certain percentage, but I think the English language, because it's a global language, American culture is a global sort of a globally known culture. It's more powerful, and it takes over easier. Like a kid who was born here, it's more like a yo yo bro kind of a thing rather than salam khubas and You know what I mean? So it's more it ta- it's more powerful, and mm-hmm. uh, believe me, it has that effect on you in 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 uh, Europe as well because American culture is everywhere. Yeah. Everybody knows it. TV, music, films, food everything so it's a very powerful culture that's why you see less of it here can you go to iran i can yeah but i haven't been there for many years would you ever want to live in iran again not living but just for uh, visiting i would say why haven't you visited then i don't know <laughs> just been out here and uh, life has uh, gone uh, on okay I've, i don't know maybe when i was a music video director i i in a bit, a little bit worried about you know going to Iran, knowing that I'm associated with with all these acts and all that stuff that you know it might tr- create trouble for me. And now it's gone so long that I don't know. If I'm I guessing you. I give, I'm guessing you never shot a video in Iran. No, no, very close to Iran, but not in Iran. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, Alec, it's 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 so gratifying talking to you. A final question, and pro- maybe the most important one that I, I could possibly possibly ask you, which is, um, tell me about Swedish pizza. <laughs> Swedish <laughs> pizza, it's a very good uh, hybrid of uh, all the Persians, Turks, Greeks, uh, Yugoslavians immigrating to Sweden and creating their own lot of flavors of, of pizza with uh, Turkish kebab, uh, Greek gyro, um, you know, different things and blending them and putting them as as topics. And it just became a phenomenon since the 1990s. And um, it was something that my brother and I always wanted to bring to the United States because anytime we saw somebody go from here to Sweden, they came back and said, "Man, you guys have the best pizza in the world." <laughs> is it is it thicker? Is it like like Iranian pizza that says like thick? No, it, no, no, it's just the toppings that makes it different. The dough is a little bit different, but the cheese is uh, Gouda cheese. But the toppings are what are what make it different. What are the when toppings? You have, uh, you have the Turkish donut kebab and and garlic sauce uh, is the most popular one, which is called kebab pizza. Um, you have uh, filet mignon and bernay sauce on oh, wow. one pizza. Yeah, <laughs> and as as somebody who grew up outside of Iran, I never understood the ketchup on pizza thing. Did Did you guys allow ketchup on your Swedish pizza? Uh, we had it, but uh, but we had Persian pizza, so they put it on their Persian pizza oh, okay. in uh, in the hybrid. But, you know, so it was one of, uh, a fun little thing we did for about four or five years. But uh, the restaurant business is very brutal on your body. So uh, eventually, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I probably wouldn't want to do it again. It was it was fun, but it wasn't my thing. And you were asking earlier on um, about you know what led you to do all, a lot of things. It's, uh, obviously, one person can't do everything on his own. So it was a sort of a hand in hand type of a encouragement from different people like for instance when i was watching uh persian videos i was sitting with my mom i'm watching and then i told her you know i need to go change these these are bad and she's like well but you definitely should and then she initially made that first uh phone call to uh to one of the singers and said you know oh, my wow. son is coming to the united states maybe you should uh try try uh, see uh what he's up to and all that stuff and then later on uh a couple of years when i was here i got uh married into a really good family who were also very supportive of that and they were supporting my vision and wife come with me to set or or do some of the a lot of the set work and uh so we i we love that your i love here. that your mom basically kick-started your music <laughs> video career that's so persian it's so cute Okay. Yeah, you got the mom and the wife all all all, all the support. You know? <laughs> the wife <laughs> coming to the set or bringing food and cooking, That's beautiful. finding your location and <laughs> all that stuff at the time. But you know, yeah, then you can, you you're able to uh, fulfill that vision. Alec Cardio, it's been a it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you thank for you. doing this. I hope to see I you soon. The time. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me on. I, I appreciate it. it. Was fun. Absolutely. Good office. Good office. Bye. Alec Cardio, he is an Iranian Swedish American music video commercial and film director. You can find him on Instagram and his obsession with cars at Cartiology. That's uh, C A R T I O L O G I, Cartiology. 
Alec Cardio joined us from Los Angeles, California today. Microphone's back on for Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, and uh, the fabulous Keon. Uh, before I get your reactions to Alec Cardio, a shout out to Arash and Anita Fazilipur. Love these two. They are life partners and business partners, the founders of MyTerms.ca. This is a mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They're both born in Iran, but grew up in Canada and the United States. So they decided to go into business and life together almost 20 years ago, and they have a really good record with MyTerms.ca, focusing on the service aspect of the mortgage business. They're very well reviewed online, and they make it a big priority to give back to the Persian community as well. Arash and Anita Fazalipur, MyTerms.ca, if you're looking for a full-service mortgage company. The good guys, people who won't take advantage of you in the Toronto or Ontario area, if you're listening to us in Canada, myterms.ca. All right, Alec Cardio, I've, you know, I very much enjoyed talking to him. He brought up a really good point that I never quite thought of that uh, social media has completely almost destroyed the music video industry, like in a way, and that makes me sad because I remember as a kid, you know, I, I was obsessed with MTV. Every, whatever, every day a new music video came out. I was like, oh, the new Backstreet Boys music yeah, video. It's yeah. like, it's co- completely gone. Like that whole, you know, I can't well, I, I go even, you go further back, you know, yeah. uh, when I was a little kid in the, mm-hmm. in the first in the 80s and then the 90s. I mean, it was, it was everything to come mm-hmm. home from school and see the new video. Yeah. And it was the only, you know, to, to, to recount what he was saying when right. we were talking about social media, it what it's done is, it's taken the mystery out of right. your rock stars, your idols, exactly. right? So when I was a kid and I was like into Duran Duran, yeah. you know, I was just waiting for the next video to come out to see what they look like. Yeah. I mean, it would, you wouldn't even know what they look like between videos, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, and as he says, now they'd just be posting. It's too much. You get sick of I mean, they probably are people. posting every day. You right. know, that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's interesting in Iran. You have to wait for a Qachakchi to come to your place and uh, open the bag and okay, this VHS is for like yeah, you know, a new true. music video and yeah, every true. like a free month you have to wait that somebody comes to your home and give you some new music. That's video. his right in the like in the nineties and uh, they would come and especially like No Rules special. There was always No Rules special that would come. This was this was the, it was shot in the U.S. in L.A. like with the whole L.A. music scene and then oh all the stars. And yeah, the all Nauru's the stars. Special, huh? yeah, they would make it like a Nooru special with like Nooru's message and stuff and music and cheesiest music <laughs> videos you'll see your like entire life. And then, yeah, the, uh, they would smuggle the VHS to Iran and then the guy would show up as if like he's trying to sell you heroin. Like yeah. it'd be like, so what do you want? Like, oh, yeah, shh, try to keep it down. And then like try to I sell you. I want to Shaper. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the Sharam Shapara you gave me last time was really good. <laughs> this, this is crazy. Wow. And then the Alec Cardio came, and I remember the first video of his that I saw was for his brother, I think, Cameron Cardio. Cameron Cardio. Mm. Yeah, I saw that, and I was like, oh, I, I thought, I thought his, his, I didn't think he was Iranian at first because mm. his name popped up. Director Alec Cardio. I'm like, definitely not Iranian. And the song wasn't even. Alec Persian. and Cameron don't sound like. I mean, we have no. Kamran, but yeah. it's not <laughs> yeah. spelled that way. No. You kind of think, oh, these are Americans totally, or something. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And then as soon as when we found out, then it, it was a whole like it revolutionized the music mm. video industry of Iran. But one thing that was very interesting for me was his personal story of. Uh, becoming a firefighter (laughs) (laughs) I was like it was so crazy and just goes to show you that you could do very many things in life and just try to find your passion it's okay if you're doing a job that it, you don't think it's yours necessarily right now? Just power through. I really like the guy. I like mm-hmm. the interview as well. Wow, words of wisdom. Maybe you Reza. should go into yeah. firefighting, <laughs> Reza. I'd be a good firefighter, I think. Would you? Yeah. Why? I think why so. do you think that? I care about 
saving fires people. no <laughs> well my last water thing. <laughs> putting out the fire he's a good looking guy and he would fit into the right, right. you, right. you want to be the calendar <laughs> he wants to be the calendar oh, i want to be on the calendar that's right <laughs> no but i think i like helping people and i don't want nothing to do with them after i help them so <laughs> i think <laughs> i think i fit right in. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting <laughs> explication of what a firefighter <laughs> is <laughs> a person who helps someone and then abandons them <laughs> nothing, nothing to do with them after uh uh, Shai, John, what uh, your thoughts on uh, Alec Cardio? Uh, yes, the difference between Persian music video industry yes. and Western music yes. video. It's like, yeah, it's huge, <laughs> the difference between them. And um, f- I mean, I don't know if I can fit myself into the Western industry, you know, because mm. I used to work with Persian industry, which is very kind of... Uh, Yelchi, do you know the meaning of Yelchi? It feels like it's it's like a constant set of backroom deals. Like you're you're like you're, uh-huh. you're everything's done in the kitchen, and oh, you just kind of you know. Yes. Uh, um, because I, I, not to cut you off, as I said in the interview, I mean, through the '90s, I was in a you know a, a pretty successful band, mid-level band. We sold half a million records, but we weren't huge, huge stars. But any time, I think we did ten videos or something. All of the videos, there was treatments done for it. You know, there was different directors vying mm-hmm. for it, and they would do a whole treatment. I mean, Reza, you would know this yeah, as somebody yeah. who's made these kind of films and, and videos. And then, you know, the artist sits down with the record company and looks at the different possibilities. And, you know, sometimes they would even shoot a trailer. They would go, this is what your video is going to look like. This is, um, so the idea that, you know, the artist himself calls up the video yes. maker and they <laughs> hang out and have a cabob and decide to, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, <laughs> And and these are big name artists. It just it kind of underscores the you know the relative size of the Persian music industry being just a lot smaller mm-hmm. than than uh, than what we've done in the West, even yeah. in a country like Canada. Yes, and what actually uh, Alex said is that you know the music I- industry was exiled you know was that exile mm. so mm. it could it, it's very hard to grow in exile Good point. You, yeah, it's yeah. 100% right. I said this before I, I would love to see the day that Persian music becomes mainstream the same way that Spanish music has in the West mm-hmm. like uh, that mm-hmm. you know w- yeah. what, what does it take to get there Despacito <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what it takes we need to call up Erfan <laughs> get him to make a Despacito <laughs> Uh, speaking of Airfoam, we're going to p- go out on that song that um, we talked about at the beginning of the show. His brand new song. It was nice to have Airfoam on the program. Thank you to Airfoam and thank you to uh, Alec Cardio for being on this edition of Rook. We're back on Monday with Roya Hakakion. Thank you uh, to the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shy. This is full time for Rook for today. Uh, thank you to the amazing team who put this show together uh, each week. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, the fabulous Keon. Pa- uh, Thoughtful Nagin, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Ahay Merdad, Sponsorship Sean, and Reza and Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. And you can go to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com for all of, all things Rook, including uh, a way to support us um, by becoming a patron. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. So... The new tune by Airfan, Virun Kun, Mizun Bashin. Dunya hame kandosho, rikhteru la boyeto, az bas ke shirine, jonune buse hayeto, man ba khodam sabba, bahro ashti karda, khodam obazidam, tu kuche hayeto. من سالها هر روز و شب موندم به پای تو حالا کمی آهسته تر دنیا مو ویرون کن من سالها هر روز و شب موندم به پای تو
قوه یه تلخ دنیا رو چشیدم فالشینه سی و چند سال تو خودم گشتم و جالبینه یه چیز رو تو خودم ندیدم اونم عاشقیمه میخوام یه جوری بخامت کل سینم بسوزه بدم دنیا رو پره و بشید دینم یه روزه آه هشی دارم به پاد میدم بسوزه شیرین تر لبت نبود این لب ببوسه وقتی تو بغلم میگو مثل تتو رو بدنم میگو مثل نفسی که میره میاد تو دهنم میگو نفس رو بده تو آروم دوباره بیرون کن جست و کسی نی آروم تا دنیا مو ویرون کن سالها روز شب و تو زندگی کردی من سالها هر روز و شب موندم به پای تو حالا کمی ها هسته تر دنیا مو ویرون کن من سالها هر روز و شب موندم به پای تو Come on.